I'm Sonia Thomes. I'm the Vice President of Operations at the Nashville Symphony here in Tennessee by day and by night and weekend. I created orchestracareers.com so that I could help spread awareness of all the careers available with an orchestra off the stage and uh, also connect you to the pros because that is the best way that you can learn more about the careers. So that's why we have our career panel today. And today is all about the work of marketing and communications. So before I have our panel introduce themselves, let's talk just really briefly about the work of an orchestra so we can best understand where does marketing and communications really fit into all of this? Um, so I work in the work uh, in operations and operations and artistic are the teams that help to create the actual concert, right? The main event, musicians on stage playing those programs. And that is a really exciting thing to do. I've loved doing that, but there's no use in putting on a concert if you don't have an audience. And so our team today is talking all about how do we get audiences interested in our programs? How do we connect them to our concerts and give them a great experience in the meantime so they'll keep coming back, right? Um, so I would love to jump right into some introductions. Uh, I'm, my name is Charlie Wade and I am the Vice President for Marketing for the Philadelphia Orchestra. Uh, I also serve as a consultant for the San Diego Symphony, and um, <clears throat> I've worked in the orchestra world for a long time, uh, happily so. Uh, and uh, the thing about marketing that I think is um, most exciting to me is that it's ever-changing and that you're really at the center of the organization in many ways, and especially an organization that puts the customer at the center of its decision-making is really one that's kind of, you know, marketing and customer centricness are, are go hand in hand. So um, that to me is part of what makes what I get to do very exciting and rewarding. Hey y'all, um, I'm Blake. I am the patron services manager at the <clears throat> Memphis Symphony Orchestra. Um, I think one of the most rewarding things about my job, it's a very small orchestra with a staff of like nine full-time people. So uh, what patron services manager means to most people is not what I do. I do a lot of the software work and I'm the, you know, front line for our patrons and I do a lot of the marketing strategy for selling subscriptions and single tickets. But um, one of my favorite parts about my job is really getting to know our patrons. And there's been a lot of opportunities to learn, you know, why a certain patron is coming to our shows or, you know, how it's impacted their life. And I love hearing stories like that because that it just gives me meaning for my work. It's nice to meet you all. Um, you're, you're amongst a great group of professionals here today, including Sonia, the mastermind of all this. So it's really, really nice to be here. And I wanted to say that, yeah, I'm the VP of marketing uh, for the Nashville Symphony. Um, and why I love marketing so much uh, for Symphony Orchestra is that we get to take the mission and, and the core values and, and the core focus of the institution, and we get to bring it to the people. And I think Charlie's point about that being interrelated and being receptive to, to folks, and, that, and that's evolved a lot in my career. Um, and I think we can all say that it has been especially thrilling uh, to be able to kind of be on the front lines of taking in what people are telling us and, and helping incorporate that into our ever revising vision and core values. Um, so that's, that's my takeaway. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Justin. Hello everyone. My name is Justin Bradford. I'm the digital media director at the Nashville Symphony and I apologize for my background. I'm doing double duty. I also cover the Nashville Predators in the NHL and the time got changed for the game to one o'clock. So I'm at the arena right now doing double duty. Uh, so digital media and communications in an orchestra is awesome to me because one, I'm a nerd and I love how we get to do nerd things and we get to share our nerdism with everyone out there to attract them to come to our shows, whether it's classical music or movies and concert or special guests or whatnot, we get to nerd out and share that with patrons. And we get to be creative in so many different ways to try to attract them to our concerts and inform them about what we're going to do. And I love that. It's never the same. It's never boring. And I think anyone in marketing communications can agree it's never boring. We're always having something change on us. Something's always different. And that's why I'm passionate about it. And I love it because we get to show our nerd, but we also get to make a difference. We are beginning to make a difference in the 
community by informing and educating people about stuff that we're passionate about. And that's why I enjoy it. Um, I'm Monica Meyer. I am the Vice President and Chief Revenue Officer for the Virginia Symphony Orchestra. Um, so I, interesting, um, I think I've worked in every department in an orchestra except for operations and production at this point. So um, I feel like I've loved every position I've ever had, but um, working in marketing and patron development, I think, uh, you know, I agree with all my colleagues that have already spoken that it's, it's a really special job. We're the people that get to stand on the front line and welcome them into the hall. So um, it's just, I, I feel fortunate that I've found um, the marketing team because I feel like that's where I've always belonged and I just took me a few minutes to get there, which is okay. Um, but again, as everybody stated, the job is different every single day. It's very fast paced. It moves quickly. No two days are ever the same. No, po no two patrons are ever the same. Um, so just finding that special niche and making sure that every snowflake is taken care of. <laughs> snowflakes, snowflakes and nerds. And we're, it's just, we're, we're, we're a little bit of everybody, right? Um, Thank you guys so much. So I want to dive right in. And one of the things I love to do with these panels is I think it's really important that you share a little bit about your career path, because as you alluded to, Monica, it is not just A plus B equals C or a straight line, right? So if you could, a couple of you could just share maybe what did you study in school? What did you think your career was going to be? And then maybe what were some key turning points that eventually led you to the work of marketing and communications? Um, so Dan, why don't I start with you? What did you study in school and what were some of the key points that turned you towards marketing? Okay, I'll try to be brief here. I wanted to be an actor and I went to a conservatory and I'll, I'll never forget, I had to bring my whole uh, dorm room in and do like one moment in time. It's this Uta Hagen exercise. And uh, I was folding laundry and, and uh, my, my professor told me I was doing it all wrong. And it, it really made me very nervous. And I was like, I don't know if I want a life of auditioning. And that's one of the reasons why I admire our musicians so much. And so I flipped to communications and then I kind of found my way back to the arts. And uh, worked my way up, I, um, you know, from, I, I don't know about my colleagues here, but many of them may share the story that, you know, I've worked in the box office. I sold playbill ads. I did group sales and I worked for a small theater. And then all of a sudden the people around me started quitting and I, uh, you know, I just took on PR and then I started doing the, the ad buys and next thing I'm budgeting and, and pricing, and um, I kind of created my own path through that, uh, just because of my thirst uh, for the business and for for bringing the arts to the people. And so then, uh, about seven years ago, I came out to Nashville um, to be the VP of marketing for the symphony, and it's just been just so great. And it's just working for a symphony as opposed to a presenting hall, it was just, it's right for me because we're so much more focused on our mission as opposed to just bringing concerts in and a different one every day. Um, it really allows me to highlight the artistry of the musicians and everything I do. And um, so that's kind of the quick route. So in undergrad, I was a vocal performance major. I was studying, I would, really wanted to be the next Renee Fleming, like that was my dream. And so, um, about my sophomore year, I found out that I was expecting a baby and I needed something more stable and secure. So when I started my master's at Memphis, um, there was this great opportunity with the Memphis Symphony to do an internship. It was unpaid. Um, so I worked there 17 hours a week unpaid and I just fell in love with the, the meaning behind it, the mission behind it, what we were doing in the education world, all of that. And I was serving my passion, which was music and getting that music to people and children. But also I got to use all my analytical data skills and my technology, you know, building skills. So it was like this perfect mesh of things. Um, so I started out as an intern and then they hired me full time after my first year. I fell in love with the administrative side. So I went and got my master's at Roosevelt, which um, Charlie Wade, who was also on the call, was one of my professors. So it's really cool. Um, and then I just kind of ended up here and. The reason why I was hired full-time, honestly, was because somebody got fired. 
And I just was there and knew how to do it. And they hired me. So that's how that happened. And I've been there ever since just taking on these different responsibilities because of the turnover. So it's been a blessing just being able to have those opportunities. I, I, um, I studied political science in school and uh, worked for five years in public radio. I was a reporter and news director, did a lot of stories for National Public Radio from Florida. I was kind of their Florida reporter for a while. And um, uh, this is dating me, but that's okay. Uh, I, I Then Reagan got elected because I was I actually wanted to go and work at NPR and I used to go up there and uh, from Florida and uh, uh, cut tape and do production assistant work. But uh, when Reagan got elected, that all changed. Suddenly NPR wasn't getting funded and uh, I started working um, uh, in telemarketing of all things for performing arts groups in Houston, Texas, and um, did really well with that. Uh, and then, you know, I just, but I got to a point where I really wanted to work with an institution in a bigger way. And I went from the Dallas Symphony to the Florida Orchestra. And, um, you know, it's interesting to hear stories like Blake's and Daniel's where, you know, you're, you're in a smaller institution and it gives you the opportunity to do more things that you might not get if you're in a big institution where you can get kind of, you know, segregated into one area. So I think that, you know, for those of you here, that should be a takeaway for you to think about if you're not sure what part of an orchestra you wanna work in, working at a smaller institution allows you more freedom. Anyway, I went on to work at the Jacksonville Symphony for a number of years where I also started booking, speaking of, you know, getting to do other things for POPs programs then to Atlanta, and I worked for the Atlanta Symphony for a good chunk of time, 15 years, and did booking there as well as doing the marketing because, you know, marketing and, and pops programs are very similar in that, you know, orchestras do pops because they want to earn money and serve another audience, but um, uh, it, it doesn't seem like it's necessarily the primary reason for the orchestra, the pop side of things, but it's really fun, and it's, it's and ultimately it's, um, more marketing oriented. So anyway, I did that. Then I went to the Seattle Symphony and I worked there for a number of, for five years. And uh, I just kind of continued to circulate through this sort of, you know, marketing and pops world. Uh, so I, I've ha been happy to live on both sides, but I, I wouldn't have been able to do that if I hadn't worked at a smaller company first. If I'd gone straight to the Chicago Symphony or Boston, that would not have happened. I started my undergrad as an oboe and English horn performance major. Um, and I was pretty lucky because my mom worked for the Pittsburgh Symphony until the day I was born. So I kind of had always had that symphony um, conversation happening in my household. So it was a very um, straight path of let's find her an instrument that's going to um, get her a scholarship. Um, so oboe was it, um, as most of you probably know, it's a pretty rare instrument. And, um, I earned a full scholarship to go to West Virginia university on performance. I was there for about, um, a year. And I said, I don't want to compete for these chairs. I don't want to do this. It's super competitive. There's only two, maybe three in every orchestra. What are the chances that I'm going to get a job? Um, and so I started thinking um, how I could turn um, and pivot, if you will, very COVID term, I'm sorry. Um, so I went to the Dean of the music school and said, hey, you guys really need an arts admin program here. Like, this is crazy. It's time, people wanna learn about this. So he said, fine, figure out the classes you wanna take and build it for me. Tell me what you think should be included and what shouldn't be included and like, just try things. Um, so I basically went to the business school and said, I need to create a minor for the music school. What does that look like? What kind of classes do I need to take? Um, so I was the first person, there is a letter with my diploma at WVU that says that I'm the first person that graduated from an arts administration minor. Um, so that was kind of cool that I just decided this is, this is the path that I'm gonna take and I'll do whatever it takes to get there. Um, so after graduation, I moved home to Pittsburgh and I applied for every single job that the Pittsburgh Symphony Orchestra had. It didn't matter. It was call room, box office, development, marketing. I didn't care what my job was going to be. And I just, I just knew that I had to be with the symphony. 
Um, so about six months of waiting, I finally got two interviews in the same week, um, one for a development job and one for a coordinator of education and community outreach job. Um, and I went into the interviews and basically I chose education based upon the people that were in the department that made me happy. <laughs> um, so I think that was the first sign of marketing for me and people and patron engagement was that I chose where I wanted to work solely based off of the team that I was interviewing with. Um, but as Charlie just mentioned, you know, I, I was fortunate enough though, too, that I moved into different departments about every other year that I was there. So I went from education um, to patron services. They launched a brand new patron services program. Um, so I, I was part of that. And then I moved into marketing in three different roles in seven years. So it was definitely um, a, a very big learning curve for me, um, especially being in a larger orchestra and having to have that fast paced and learning uh, different things at those times. And I um, was on vacation in Virginia Beach um, in 2014. And I saw an amphitheater outside along the beach. And I said, who in the world plays here? Looked it up, saw the Virginia Symphony, saw the job for director of marketing, applied. And when two weeks later, I moved. So um, it was definitely, I think, a very big match. And it was something that felt right at the time. And Seven years later, I'm still here. And I definitely went from a $32 million organization to a six and a half million dollar organization, um, which was a large difference um, because in Pittsburgh, my jobs were very niche and I had one job, it felt like. Here, we joke that like everybody just does everything. There's, there's no room for anybody to not have a skill. If you don't have that skill, you learn that skill. And um, you know, it's, it's just a fabulous time. So I'm excited that to continue in this industry and it's fun. I went to Cumberland University down here in, in Nashville in the Nashville area and I'm a theater major. So my degree is actually in theater. My original program was business and marketing, but I didn't like the really intense math that they were going to make me take. And so I changed my major. I mean, I'm being fully honest here. <laughs> so I knew that, that I could do theater. I enjoy the people in the program. I enjoy the program as well. And if anything, what that helped teach me is how to present myself, how to be creative and how to have support and being creative. That's really the main takeaways I took from the theater program. The first job out of school was actually working for my alma mater in alumni relations and development. So nonprofit, higher education. And that was interesting because it was one of those things where you have to do so many different types of jobs and whatever they ask you to do, you do, and you don't get a raise for it. It's just what you, what we kind of did, especially in a private institution like that, but went on and, and I learned a lot of skills there from communications to public relations, social media, because that's, that was in the late 2000s when social media was starting to really take off in terms of being able to market through social media and it kind of was self-taught in that area. And that's kind of what I pride myself on is self-teaching myself how to use Twitter. I mean, that's when it came along, was in 08, 09, is how I learned how to use Twitter and, and all those other different social mediums. And then after that, went into the corporate world and into auto glass and being a marketing and auto glass and online strategy and then book publishing. Uh, from there, uh, I definitely missed nonprofit life and being in a job where I feel like the work I do matters and makes a difference to the community that I serve and that I'm in. And I was very, very thankful to find the job posting for online media coordinator for the National Symphony at the time. And I got my resume in two days before the job posting closed. And so I was very lucky with that and utilized networking connections just because we all know how important it is to network like what we're doing right now and meeting other people. And with my other job in, in sports, I was able to utilize my network there that the president and CEO of the National Predators, he put in a phone call for me at the Nashville Symphony and made sure that I got an interview. With the, with the VP there. They said, hey, I don't, I don't really know you, but this guy's really good. You really need to give him a look. And the VP then, Jonathan Marks, uh, who is now our interim COO, said that he scrolled my Facebook profile and liked that I have a cat. And that's what really said that he wanted to interview me. Uh, but that was kind of my path to the Nashville Symphony. 
Uh, and it's just taught me so much. And then we've learned so much there as we go in being creative and my side job in sports and radio and digital media crosses over a lot with what I do. Both are the entertainment industry, but very different sides of the entertainment industry. So I've learned so many different skills and different ways to reach people in new and different ways and trying to take what I utilize in the orchestra world. Now I can apply that to reaching new people in the sports world and vice versa all the time. So that's why I really like the well-rounded approach that I've taken in sports and music because I learn a lot from each one and how I can apply those different strategies and how to be creative in each. And I take a lot of what I learned just in, in sports and see how can we adapt this to orchestra life? How can we adapt this to communications and marketing and take some of the good strategies at work or see what hasn't worked in sports and say, we need to make sure we don't ever do this uh, and vice versa as well. So it's, it's been a very unique approach for me and my background, uh, but it's something I'm very thankful for that I have that type of well-rounded approach and something that's a, a little bit different. Justin, thank you so much. Um, so I hope you all are hearing like there's not only no two days are the same in the world of working for an orchestra, but no two paths are the same either. And I think that's really important to know that um, there are lots of different ways to come to work for an orchestra. So, um, okay, so I would love to dive a little bit now into conversation. Specifically, um, Justin, if you don't mind, we'll come right back to you just to say, can you describe the role of communications within the work of the orchestra? You did a little bit, but what is it about telling the story of the orchestra that is so important for organizations? Well, what's, what's unique about comms, especially in, I think, in all over nonprofit is you're working closely with marketing, but you're also working closely with every other department in the orchestra as well. We work closely with development, with education, with, with everyone there, because we are the ones that help bring, bring the message out and develop that message and find creative ways to reach people. And so we kind of serve as our own in-house company, comms company and public relations company to help serve every single department. Obviously, when it comes to marketing and concerts, we work very, very closely for, for the National Symphony. Marketing and comms work so close together. We're building the website, we're social media campaigns, email campaigns. We work very close together. So I work with Dan uh, every day and every hour we're, we're talking to each other and trying to strategize things, but it's building close relationships with, within the, every single department and seeing what we can do best to utilize the resources we have and how do we continue to progress with our mission and how do we find new creative ways to do it, especially when you're on a limited budget. Sometimes you're trying to find different ways to how you can be creative and utilize organic type of posts where you don't have to spend money all the time. How can you organically market things? Obviously, we all know we have to spend money to make money, uh, but there's trying to find new creative ways to reach different people and being at the top of different strategies as well, especially social media changes all the time. We have to be up to date with what's going on and how we utilize these different mediums, how do we utilize the algorithms that they have. So that's where you see communications and marketing really crossing paths a lot because we have to work closely together uh, in order to be successful. Thank you. Um, any of our other panelists have anything to add about the role of communications or telling the orchestra's story, maybe challenges or things that come naturally to the work of an orchestra? Yeah, I, I think one of the things that's um, been uh, uh, emerging over the last, I don't know, five, 10 years maybe, but more so now is um, uh, understanding that orchestras, like a lot of organizations, sit on top of a huge pile of uh, emotional capital, if you will, you know, that we, we think about the product that we sell a lot and the stories in the product, but there, but there, are, and there are lots of stories within the institution as well, um, and uh, certainly um, there. Are, uh, some of them are easy to get to, some of them aren't. But you've got uh, you've got all your musicians, you've got uh, you've got a history of the institution, you've got um, uh, you know the various guest artists. All of that um, helps uh, mold not just a story about the institution, but makes it a relatable place. And I think that's one of the things that that people crave is authenticity and personal a personalness. And so, you know, it's not uncommon for us to hear that, um, you know, in focus groups or, or or just in the lobby, how much people enjoy learning about the, the individual musicians on stage, as opposed to just this kind of, you know, you know faceless group of people up there, if they begin to have a way, it, it provides them a way into the institution. So being able to tell stories like that and finding ways, uh, you know, to, to, to do it, as Justin was saying, you know, social media is a great way of doing that. 
Um, so I, I think that's, it's often, it's not that it's overlooked. I think people think about it, but we, we don't often think about it strategically enough. I'll put it that way. So Dan, I know you care so passionately about the customer experience. And, and so how, do, how does all this, how does that weaving that story into just the, the work that you do yeah. to get the right product on stage? How does all that come together? You know, it's, it's interesting, uh, Sonia, because I was about to interject with, with something very similar to what you're asking me um, right now. And I, I want to just frame this with, with COVID for a second um, and just get, get kind of real with you guys about how COVID has impacted our business and I can tell you that each one of us know that communications has carried us through, right? Mm -hmm. And it's the transparency that we have with our audience and our musicians and the challenges that each symphony has faced, right? Memphis has faced a different challenge than Philly. Philly has, and Virginia and Nashville, but I can speak for Nashville really intimately, right? But we furloughed 131 people. Right. And we had to communicate that to the public. Right. And we developed um, and we canceled 140 concerts at the same time. Right. So communications was our line to to getting the community to understand, educate them, hear from them. Um, and it really like. It, I mean, really, I honed in on communications this year in just a way that I never have before. One on one. I went back to my telemarketing skills like Charlie was telemarketing. I did, too. But I flipped it and I was talking to people about why not getting a refund would help sustain the symphony. Right. But we use that as an opportunity to hear their voice, hear what they have to say, kind of incorporate that into our overall thinking of how we reemerge. And I can tell you coming out, you know, we're not out of COVID yet, but I do feel like we are starting to turn the corner and we're starting to hire people again and build our teams again. And all that stuff is really great, but the way we communicate with people, the way we bring people back and re onboard them and get them aligned with how the institution has changed. It's all communications, both internal and external. And for us, we haven't spent one marketing dollar, you know, in like a year, right? So it's been all communications, right? So, and I'm sure you, you, you talk, and I didn't know, I didn't mean to flip it to COVID, Sonia, yet if you had like a trajectory, but I just wanted to say how vital communications has been. And it's really... You know, and the community has 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 heard our call, thankfully, and they've been there to support us. And they've, you know, got to the point where we can bring the musicians back, albeit part time on a stipend uh, because of the support that they've given us. Right. So it's very, very humbling. But I can tell you that that transparency in the way we we wrote emails and the way we posted on social and the way we spoke with people one on one. Um, like right now we have a project, talk about communications. Every musician is calling everyone who's kept or donate their tickets and thanking them. And they're having real conversations with 7,000 customers, right? But those are the things that are going to carry us through COVID and make us come out real strong on the other side. And then we can start piling in the revenue and the customer experience and the concert and, and curating that. Um, and where other other symphonies, you know, um, have done a lot with streaming. Unfortunately, we have not been able to do that because of our circumstance and our financial situation and, and how we're emerging right now um, from the pandemic. So I just want to say that communications is vital and it's really just um, carried me through. Thank you, Dan. So Blake, you have mentioned a little bit about your work. Um, how maybe has your work shifted in these last months then? I think that's a good little segue actually. And cause you mentioned you guys are doing in-person concerts. So how's that changed your work? Um, well, to go off what um, Daniel said, it's been a very um, transparent process. 
just telling them, hey, and we started selling these concerts before we even knew if they were going to actually happen. So, you know, and being very transparent with our patrons saying, hey, look, we're going to sell these to you. And if, if they don't happen, we'll do everything we can to make you happy, get your money back, whatever. But letting them know how we're going about it. And then also, you know, this has been, we've tried to spend as little money as possible uh, getting these people back. So with nine people, that's my job to call all of these patrons and have these conversations with them and make sure that they're comfortable and excited. And so my job is like 95% on my cell phone and then 10% on my computer. Like that's it. That's all, that's all I've got. Um, and it's, it's a lot of hard work and a lot of conversation. And it, it's been really insightful just hearing, you know, the feedback people saying we're not ready to come back yet and knowing that and putting that in the database and saying, okay, well, these are our patrons that are not comfortable. And these are our patrons that are excited. And these are our patrons that are reserved. So it's been a really great opportunity for us to get to know our patrons one, and then also track, you know, their behavior. And so later in the future, we'll know like, okay, these people, this group of people loves our concerts, but they care about the community and the health of the community. And so how are we going to attract them to come back? you know, in the fall when things open back up. So having that data and having that information about them, it's been really insightful. And, and it, I'm glad that it's been my job just because I can do it the way that I think is best so that our whole organization can benefit from it. So my job has always been patron centric, but now it's even more so it's more personal. It's not me sending an invoice. It's me making a phone call. It's not me saying it, sending an email. It's me talking to someone over the phone, actual and it's been great because I used to have a whole box of staff that helped me do that. And now it's just, just me. So it's been really, really personal and really, really insightful. Monica, I wonder, do you have a philosophy of like market, like customer service? Um, like, do you, do you have, do you have like these kind of principles or tenants that you hold to that you think are the way you, you try to serve customers? Sure. So um, it's kind of funny because I feel like I learned these pretty early on in life. Um, in high school, I worked at Arby's. And um, after that, I worked at The Gap. So I feel like I've learned, I learned my customer service like standards at those places before I even came into the orchestra world. Um, as you can imagine, fast food and retail are like the best two places to learn uh, the customer is always right. Uh, the customer, whatever it takes to make the customer happy is what it takes. Um, especially, you know, with the discussion of COVID, we pretty much said to our subscribers, like, whatever you want to do is what we're going to do. You're the boss and you're in charge. However you want to play this, if you want to stay home and watch it virtually, if you want to come into the hall, if you want to make sure that you're seated at least 10 feet from people instead of six, I'll make that happen for you because I think that you're very special. Um, and I think especially with subscribers and even subscriber donors, you have to have that personal touch. Like Blake was speaking about, you know, just understanding and making sure that everybody feels heard. Um, I think that's really the most important thing that's happening right now um, is just to understand what the patron really needs and what they're excited about, whether it's coming back in person or viewing it virtually. Um, but you know, it's, that's always been my philosophy is kind of that simple, like the customers are always right, even though if they aren't, um, we'll find a way to try to make it seem like they are, um, within reason, I guess. <laughs> I, my favorite term is Ben don't break, you know, yes. I mean, <laughs> The thing here's here's just a point I want to I want to make um, about marketing. Marketing is 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 very very important to pay the bills, right? And at the end of the day, we need the revenue in order to keep the doors open. And fundraising um, is just as vital. So I mean, having that customer experience where you're selling the right product to the right person, right? And bringing them along, right? And making sure that they're engaged and they're fulfilled. And if they're not, they have a direct line to um, voice themselves and they're heard and they're responded to in a very transparent and sincere way, um, I think is really, really important. As everybody thinks about the customer experience when the lights go up, and the, and the conductor raises his baton or her baton, 
but it, the customer experience, you know, starts when people just like kind of see an ad for you or f- hear from a friend and then they investigate, they go to your website, that's customer experience. They deal with everybody from the moment that starts to the moment you leave. Right. And so for me, I've always just said that we want to be, you know, we want to be real with our people and we want to really, we want to, we want to sell a lot of tickets and we want to make a lot of revenue, but we want to make sure we're, we're, we're putting the right product in front of the right people. And sometimes you learn the hard way doing that because it's all about acquisition and retention and growth. Um, but you want to make sure that people are um, pleased with, with the way they're being treated and the products they're being sold. And I believe at the end of the day, if you can get that equation, right, it, it's really going to help your whole, um, you know, marketing soar. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Dan. So I want to honor Justin's time. Does anybody have any questions for Justin? We're going to kick this off. I would love to know from being on um, two sides of the entertainment industry, how much branding has impacted? Like, is it more important in the classical music industry than the contemporary um, vice versa, just with sports and media and music and how that all comes to fruition? Yeah, great question. And I apologize for the backup noise. They're warming up. And so there's a lot of music here. Uh, But branding, I think, is important in both aspects, but it's a different approach to each. Because I think, especially in the symphony world and the orchestra world with us, it's branding on how we are part of the community, how, how we're trying to grow music, education. There's so many different aspects of it. And in sports, in my experience with that, it's branding a different type of customer experience because they're paying a lot of money. I mean, yes, people pay money for orchestras and our concerts and everything, but I feel like the investment level that people feel sometimes in sports, they get emotional and angry at times as well because it's a different type of emotional experience that they're involved in. So in terms of with orchestra, they're they're investing into something that's a little bit different. And, and that's what I'm seeing as well. They're investing in the community. They're investing into education. They're investing into music. They're investing into growth of the community as well. And that's what I think is the difference in the branding there as well. And it's a good challenge for me to have to put on different hats as well because I'm trying to grow my own media blog and my own radio show as well as focus on what I'm doing in the orchestra world as well and what we could do to spread that message. And that's where social media has taught me a lot too in seeing different aspects of it and trying to find creative ways to interact with people uh, too. And I do want to throw out as well to folks too, if any questions, I'm more than happy to be interactive on Twitter, especially at Justin B. Bradford. I am a film score nerd and I love film score. So if you think of something after I'm gone, feel free to tweet me. I'm more than happy to discuss on Twitter as well. Let's just open it up for questions. Um, you guys have been listening for a while now about the work of marketing and communications. You've heard a lot of different things. There's so many different directions we can go with the rest of our time today, but just go ahead and raise your hand or unmute, jump in and ask a, a panelist a question. Uh, so there's been kind of an exciting push, especially recently to have more diversity in programming, more diversity in representation, and then reaching new members of the community that maybe weren't previously involved in orchestras. So I'm wondering if that has changed your recent approaches to uh, marketing and communications. I would jump in. I think that's a great question. Um, And thank you for asking it. And I would say 100%. Um, And one of the things that I learned um, in my former job as 10 years for a presenting hall, we did all kinds of stuff for um, anywhere from like Bollywood or like classic Indian dance to to modern dance to to R&B, theater, I mean, you name it, comedy. And that really helped lick my chops is what I like to say in terms of reaching new markets. And it's one of my favorite things to do. And the one thing I really, really learned um, about it is that it's very cultural in terms of how people um, attend concerts, what their purchasing patterns are, where they like to buy. Um, uh, for instance, the Hispanic market, um, they deal a lot in consignment where they're, they're getting tickets um, in their neighborhood from people they trust. 
Um, so if you want to, you know, attract that market, you've got to go out into that community and do it. I guess you know? my point is, is just that it's all very cultural and you have to, you have to um, approach it with humility and, and understand that you don't have all the answers because you've been selling a certain way all the time to a certain type of audience. So it's a lot of listening, a lot of learning, a lot of partnerships and not being afraid to listen and make those partnerships. Um, I just am wondering from the panelists if there's any advice that anyone has for someone like myself who only has um, a background in music performance of how to break into the field. Apply and network as much as you can. I mean, I can speak for probably all the panelists on the screen. You should all, you should connect with us on LinkedIn. You should email us. You should ask us if there's jobs that are open. You should ask us if there's internship opportunities. Internships, even if they're unpaid, um, are worth your time. Don't limit yourself to saying, I, I was only a problem performer. I don't have, you surely have skills that would come over to the communications and marketing. The thing that set me apart when, when I was an unpaid intern and then I got a full-time position at the same place was that I knew classical music. I was the only one on staff at that time in the administrative symphony office that knew classical music, that knew if Tchaikovsky was spelled incorrectly, or that knew how many movements were in a piece. You know, that was huge because in marketing, it's not just how do we attract our patrons, but how do we sell what we're performing? And if you're clueless about the music, you can't connect anyone with that. You have to connect yourself first with the music. So being a performer and having that skill set is invaluable for this career. Get yourself trained online. Learn about data analytics, SEO. Um, go ahead and take a course about customer data platforms. Become certified. All these little things will help you get into marketing because marketing departments are just evolved like crazy. I mean, we all want marketing data people that help us make sure we're sending the right messages to the right people in the right form at the right time. So, and there's a lot that you can learn even for free or very inexpensively online and get certified for. So I would recommend that. So I would just add also, Ariana, that you might want to ask yourself, like, what do you like doing? Uh, like, how is your mind sort of work? Are you more about, uh, do you think really logistically a lot, you know, and, and about how things work? Uh, you might think about an operations, you, you know, um, path or if you like people uh you know if you're more the psychologist uh then you might think about development you know uh, it's not that marketing people don't like people we do but uh you know marketing is kind of the sociology of um the orchestra world whereas you know development is kind of the psychology uh, once you get the job and you're faced with something that you don't know how to do what kind of like support do you can you expect from like your colleagues like are, are, are you expected to be able to figure out on your own or like are people going to help you along the way and kind of train you and 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 give you that um that that technical experience it's a great question uh i think it depends a little bit on the institution to tell you the truth ryan S some organizations are you know know how to onboard and, and many of us don't um but presumably whatever job you're hired for you've passed some level of qualification so that you, you know, I, I, I'll tell you, I often hire people's, uh, people sometimes for uh, aptitude. Uh, it, it, you know, a lot of times you can get somebody who's got all the skills, but they don't have a sense of curiosity. They don't have a sense of humor. Uh, and, and I would rather hire somebody who maybe doesn't know the skills of the job because none of what we do is rocket science. I mean, it's all stuff you can learn. It's, it's how you approach the, the job. Are you doing it in a, you know, curiosity is like my favorite value of all because, or trait, I guess I should say, uh, because you're never bored. You're always wanting to learn. And that's what those of us who are hiring want that. We want that enthusiasm, that desire to learn more because, um, you know, we don't know it all. And, and we want people out there who are trying to figure it out with us. It's really about the institution and your core values and don't be afraid of your core values. And, and you, you wanna find the right fit. 
Do you know what I'm saying? And the right fit for you will be people probably that want to teach you those skills, not make, make you have them before you come in. Right. Because from what I'm hearing, Ryan, is that you want to grow, you want to learn new things. And a lot of times that happens on the job. So it's about finding the right fit. Sorry. I, I know. I just was going to agree with everything that's what that's being said. Like, my first role was in an education department and I didn't have an education degree and they wanted somebody who was like, wanted to be a teacher. And they just realized that I was a hustler and that I would learn whatever needed to be learned because I was the right fit for their team. And now, even when I'm hiring, I can teach somebody marketing. I can teach you how to do digital and Google AdWords and whatever else. I just want to know that somebody's going to come here and have the passion and work hard and be committed to the work that we do. And that's, that's really what I'm looking for in somebody. Cause I can teach you the rest, but as long as you have the right attitude and you're willing to put in the work, that's what makes you a good fit for my team. And I'll just add really quickly uh, that Ryan, you are going to be your best advocate. Number one. And number two, I think what gives me longevity in my career is honestly never wanting to stop learning. Like I am a lifelong student. And so it doesn't stop. <laughs> it doesn't like you hit, you magically hit two years into your job and you know everything like, oh my gosh, talk about not knowing everything. We're living it right now. <laughs> um, but I think just know that you are going to, you're going to care the most about your professional development anywhere you go. But people are going to, if you let people into that and invite them to help you, they're going to, they're, you're going to find the people that are going to want to help you, but you're probably going to have to always be the initiator of it um, in most cases. And then if you shift organizations, then you've got to learn how that organization does their work. I did that. I was at nine years at the Pittsburgh Symphony. I learned, I, I used to joke, all I know I learned at the Pittsburgh Symphony. Well, that's not true anymore. I've been at the Nashville Symphony six years. But when I came to the Nashville Symphony, I had to learn how the Nashville Symphony did things. So there is ne never stop learning <laughs> and you will um, get far into your career for sure. So my question is, how do you know, especially in this field, since you've said there's been so many different pathways, how do you know how to balance college with getting internships and getting different experiences overall, if that makes sense? Carve your own path and don't be afraid to do that. Right. And if you if, if you love symphony orchestras and you really want to pursue that as a career, which I hope all of you do. Right. Because it's 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 a wonderful career path and it's very fulfilling. Then go for it and there will be a spot for you. I, I would add one more thing to what Dan just said, uh, um, that that Christian, uh, at, you know, just have lots of conversations. Talk to lots of people. Actually, at Georgia State, there's a really great uh, marketing professor named Ken Bernhardt, who's a really bright guy who's worked in the in the not-for-profit and and the arts world for a long time. Get to know Ken; very sweet guy. And you know, you just you need to start finding people like that can help guide you. So what I'll say is, you your number one job right now is just to lean into your college experience, your school experience, learn as much as you can, make as many connections as, as you can. And then be open to the possibilities about how those skills and those networks could be coming together. Because I had no idea as an oboist, I was going to turn into a 15 year career operations manager. And I love the work. So you're doing all the right things. Keep, keep pushing down this path and uh, pulling those threads as they come your way. And then just be open to the possibilities that it might bring you to. And if you are not sure if marketing and communications is where you want to be, there's already on my YouTube channel um, a development panel that we did two weeks ago. We've got an education, community engagement, youth orchestra panel coming up in April, and then also artistic ops. So um, we're just are providing these career day panels so you can get this kind of taste of what it's like and meet the pros. Um, I want to give a big thank you to the panelists today uh, for dedicating their time on a Saturday to share with you. Thank you so much. It's just been so amazing to hear what my friends in the in, in the business are um, doing, and I get to the joy of learning from them every day. And 
to our attendees, you are you are our colleagues. You just happen to be still in school. And, and what I mean by that is that that's why I feel so adamant about welcoming you now, because you're going to join us, and I'm we're all excited that you are. You guys, <laughs> if you are the future, we are in good hands. 